this uh, workshop is about technical standards and uh, its purpose is to introduce uh, technical standards uh, to aspiring entrepreneurs who may be uh, young engineers, uh, may have just graduated, are looking to uh, find a new position in the industry, or uh, they want to develop uh, a new product and want to start a new business. Uh, my game plan is the following. I'll show you uh, who I am, uh, and then I'll get into what you can achieve uh, from today's workshop. Uh, my name is Bilal. Some of you may already uh, have interacted with me. Uh, if not, I'm from Texas a and University at Qatar. I'm an associate professor in the mechanical engineering program. And my background is in material science and engineering. I hold a PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, I did that back in 2010. Um, my area of expertise is broad. It's related to uh, behavior and selection of materials for extreme environments. Uh, and a common example would be the oil and gas industry. Uh, other interests that I have are corrosion in metallic alloys. And uh, these days, a lot of my research activity is on advanced manufacturing, things like 3D printing and other advanced joining uh, processes. So this is my uh, profile. Uh, what I intend to do is cover these um, five uh, learning objectives today. Uh, first, what I wanna do is give you an idea of what a standard is. Uh, now there is a good chance that some of you may already have some idea of what a technical standard is. Uh, and when I say technical standard, I'm really talking about engineering standards here and that's going to be the purpose of the talk. The next thing I wanna do is discuss with you why these standards are uh, important. Uh, hopefully by the time we conclude this workshop, you should be able to recognize how you may use a standard, um, what are some of the different types of standards. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about ASTM standards, the American Society for Testing of Materials, and uh, what type of components their standards have. Uh, last, if time permits, uh, what I intend to do is introduce you to the process of initiating a new standard, uh, how to develop a standard, and then eventually, what is the pro process of publishing um, a standard? So with this game plan in mind, um, what I intend to do is first go over a few definitions. I'd like to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and then I'll get into, uh, take a couple of examples of standards. Um, and then uh, we'll get into, if time permits, again, uh, how to develop a new standard. Now, the way I want to describe the uh, game plan and the house rules for today is that you may be able to ask any question at any point uh, through the chat window that is available to you. Uh, now, that is visible to me, but while I'm uh, talking to you, I may not be able to look at them uh, uh, right away. So I'll let them accumulate and then I'll try to address some of them together. Now, if there is a question which uh, comes out uh, from the audience and is not uh, directly related to my area of expertise, I'd be more than happy to address that. Uh, but for that, what I would request is please wait till the end of the presentation and you should be able to see um, my email address and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you after we have finished uh, the talk. Now the talk is scheduled for about one hour. What I intend to do is speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, depending on uh, uh, the way the audience um, interjects. And um, what I've done is I've created some knowledge checks, three or four of them, which I'll try to introduce during the conversation. And if you, um, if you feel uh, that you have understood the material, please go ahead and answer. So that's the game plan. Uh, and before I get into the the knows uh, of, of why we would like to cover standards. I just want to give you an example. Let's assume that you go outside of Qatar and you want to buy something and you want to take uh, your credit card uh, or your ATM card and you want to insert that into a machine. 
And what you realize is that the card is not able to fit in the slot of that ATM machine. Now that may not have ever happened to you and there is a good reason for that. Um, let me give you another example. Let's say that you stroll out and you go to your favorite shop and you wanna buy a light bulb. And when you go there, uh, you are rest assured that when you purchase that bulb, when you come back, it will fit right into the lamp that you have at home. Now these two examples explain to you the importance of standards. If we don't have standards, if we don't have this way of talking to each other, then things as simple as a credit card or buying a light bulb can become a headache. Now, let me give you another example. For example, when you're traveling from Qatar to another country, there is a good chance that you would need a converter for your, um, let's say, uh, a smart table device. The power requirements may be different in a different country. On the other hand, when you use your USB to connect your uh, device to, to the charging device, there is no problem. The reason for that is that there are items that we create in this world which are according to internationally recognized standards, and then there are other items which uh, do not follow uh, these kind of um, standardizations that rigorously, and they are more regional in um, nature. Both of them serve different purposes. Now, my purpose today is to give you an idea of what ASTM standards are. Uh, it is one of the largest standards development organizations. It has been around for uh, over a hundred plus years. And uh, you would notice that it doesn't matter if you're on the road, if you're driving on a bridge, uh, the buildings that we live in, all of them, uh, uh, all of them uh, basically rely uh, on ASTM standard, their quality, their safety is enhanced by these standards. Something as simple as a water bottle that you may have near you, it also depends on the use of a number of technical standards and some of them may be ASTM standard. Uh, the bottom line is standards are, uh, they provide us thought space, they provide us a common language, they enable professionals to talk uh, from different uh, in diverse uh, industries. Uh, they allow us to come together, and then once we speak that same language, things become easy. Now, ASTM has a, a, a way of managing their technical standards. Uh, they have a ton of different technical committees, uh, over 140 technical committees. Each one of them has credible experts who develop them. Now, who are these committees? These committees are basically uh, composed of uh, people from all walks of life. They come from this, all kinds of stakeholders, um, businesses, um, academic experts like myself, uh, people who would be using it. Uh, and then once they're put in a committee, their real job is to come up with a minimum set of requirements that will enable uh, a user or consumer to see what is the standard for a specific item. In other words, the philosophy is quite straightforward. When you're dealing with international technical standards, you are de dealing with building consensus. So with that thought, uh, let's look at a typical engineering standard. Now, engineering standards, like I said, they are agreements and they're made between different industry segments, uh, uh, markets, um, let's say people who may give you research grants, uh, government folks, academics, and these are documented into, um, into legal documents that can then become uh, part of, uh, part of uh, contracts, part of proposals. And the reason they, they are developed this way is because they contain uniform engineering and technical guidelines. And then these guidelines ensure that the materials that uh, that we use are the products and the processes that are being used or the services uh, that are being provided to us or we are providing to someone else are standardized. Standards are generally developed by consensus, uh, but we do not necessarily have to achieve 100% agreement. Uh, let's say if you're developing a, 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 a standard and not 100% consensus is possible, in that case, 
any of the objections from any of the stakeholders is listed and made part of a uh, standard. Or if a specific request is rejected, uh, the reason for rejection of that um, request is also mentioned in a standard. Now again, uh, the standards are all voluntary. These are created by voluntary organizations like ASTM standards, for example. Uh, and as soon as they are adapted by governments, uh, they become codes, they, becomes, uh, they become um, mandatory, and they become regulatory. So let me just explain it one more time. Standards are documented agreements, which are voluntary. However, once they become part of a government's uh, uh, requirement, then you call them as regulations or codes. Moving on, uh, since we're talking about ASTM, ASTM defines a standard in its own way uh, because it has its own requirements. Uh, they would qualify a document that has been developed and established within the consensus process of the society, the society being the ASTM, that meets the technical approval uh, of ASTM procedures and regulations um, is constituting, uh, is considered to constitute a standard. Now, there are tons of technical standards organizations out there. ASTM is just one of them. Uh, there is IEEE, uh, you may have heard about APIs, IGAs, SEAE, all of these organizations exist uh, with a different charter or with a different market segment in mind. ISO, DIN, BSI, these are more international organizations. DIN represents the German standards, BSI are the, uh, the British standards. Qatar also has its own uh, general organization for standardization. QS, uh, which is uh, really a, a, a established back in, I believe, 2000, and uh, it uh, today, I believe, it falls under the Ministry of Environment, it has many core functions, but the main ones really are to elaborate and publish cutter products and service standards. So my suggestion would be the ones who went through this, and if you're interested in developing a new product, or interesting, a, uh, interested in creating a new standard for your product, then you may want to check out what QS has to offer. Uh, their goal is, again, the same as uh, to ensure high quality and safety of products. Uh, and they're also part of the Standards and Metrology Institute for the Islamic countries. And here on the right side, there are some, com uh, some of their recent uh, roles in, 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 in and uh, standard development initiatives um, that they have been part of. Uh, one of them has to do with a lot of food products, agricultural products, uh, and things of that nature. Now, what I want to do is I want to just peek onto the web since I'm doing this behind my computer screen. So I want to share my browser and I want to just show you the way you can approach some of these standards. So for example, if you look at the ASTM website, it tends to give you a ASTM compass you may access that through a library portal. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, uh, standards collections also available through standard libraries. I'm using the Texas A&M University Library, uh, but depending on what kind of access your company has, you may be able to access these uh, documents. Now, if you go to the IEEE uh, standards, of course, there you see a lot of standards related to the information technology, all the way from power and energy uh, to test on suit uh, specifications and technification. Uh, DIN, of course, the German standardization um, uh, organization and the ISO for Qatar is also mentioned. I guess the point of mentioning all of these standards is that there is, uh, uh, there is this uh, standards organizations and there is a dearth, there, there is not a dearth of these organizations. There are tons of these. So why I want to talk more about ASTM is because uh, it is more uh, closer to if you're trying to develop a new product or if you're trying to pick a new material uh, or if you're trying to uh, come up with a practice, a guide, a classification uh, or a terminology. So what I want to do is first start with looking at uh, a typical ASTM standard. Most of the times the uh, standards that ASTM creates fall in one of these two categories, test methods 
or specifications. Uh, the specifications, uh, the, the reason we develop them is to either ensure safety of a product, that it operates under a safe requirements and set of uh, guidelines, uh, or uh, that we want to make sure that it meets minimum requirements that might be uh, acceptable to a certain segment of the market. The other standards are uh, uh, given here. I've just taken one of the test methods type standards from ASTM. I've just posted it here to show you how it kind of looks like. Uh, test methods really are ways to create definitive procedures that produce test results, something as simple as measuring the density uh, of a material. Uh, another type of ASTM standards are practices. These are, again, definitive set of instructions uh, that are used to perform one or more specific operations, uh, which does not include a test result. Uh, ASTM also creates guides. Uh, these are basically compendiums, uh, a series of informations, um, uh, uh, sorry, information on series of options that uh, these, are, these are not recommendations, but specific course of actions, so to speak. Um, another type are classifications. These are systematic arrangements or divisions, uh, which deals with materials, products, systems, or services, uh, and they're based into different groups, characteristics, such as uh, composition, uh, properties, or use. The last bit is quite interesting. It's called the terminology standards. And these are documents which basically tell us what is the standard term for a specific item in a specific uh, industry. So for example, those of you who are interested in 3D printing, if you go and look at the additive manufacturing terminology standard of ASTM, it will list all of these terminologies in a very clear and concise manner. So moving on, uh, let's do a quick knowledge check. Since this is a very dry subject, I want to make sure that the audience is, uh, is with me to a degree. Uh, so the knowledge check, the way it's going to work is for you to please just use your chat window. And what you can do is look at this question and then try to tell me if this is a true or a false. Uh, the question is quite straightforward. Standards meet the approval requirements of a society's procedures and regulations provide a common language to all stakeholders. And I could see some of the answers coming in. Uh, and yes, this is correct. Uh, standards have to meet the approval requirements of the society's procedures. Let's say in case of ASTM, uh, they are the governing body. If you're dealing with the IEEE, they're the society who would look at it. Now, moving on, uh, here is another quick knowledge check. In this case, in general, the use of standards is mandatory. What do you guys think? Based on the information that I've already presented you, is that mandatory? I'm just gonna take a pause till I start to see some answers. I can see uh, uh, a lot of you are answering that it is false and I'm glad to see that. Yes, this is false unless a standard is made part of a government's contract or put inside a, um, a legal document, it is not mandatory. It becomes mandatory and then we call it a cord which then governs the legal process. All right, great. So uh, moving on, let's explore a standard document. Uh, if you look at this one, this is a standard specification for uh, deformed and plain carbon steel bars for concrete reinforcements. Uh, assume that uh, this standard uh, is uh, is basically described by a um, by a by an architect who is trying to design a building, and uh, instead of putting all sorts of details about I need this kind of steel, it should have this kind of strength, it should have these kind of corrosion properties. All they need to do is just put the document number, and that does the job in a very clear and concise manner. So when that building that the architect has defined, has designed, builds, needs to be built, the contractor which immediately know uh, what is the composition, strength, the quality of the steel they need to use, um, and then 
uh, the process becomes simpler and there is less chance of a mistake uh, to happen, which ensures, again, safety. Uh, the simplification of, uh, of communication between all parties is always uh, one of the goals of developing standards. And uh, remember, like I said, there are thousands of such standards which are available and they eliminate the, the need for lengthy contracts, descriptions, uh, for new projects, new proposals. So instead of writing everything about this carbon steel, you can simply reference this standard. Now let's dig deeper into a standard document um, that basically um, is about uh, evaluating the ignition sensitivity and fault tolerance of oxygen pressure regulators used for medical and emergency applications. Again, a very simple concept. Um, it's a standard test method type standard, and it allows anyone sitting anywhere to use this standard test method to evaluate uh, a device, which is pressure regulators, by following this standard. And rest assured, when they follow the standard, then the safety standards can also be um, maintained. Moving on, uh, here is another example. This is a example of an ASTM standard guide for evaluating non-metallic materials for oxygen service. Let me explain what oxygen service is. Um, in most of the oil and gas industry, uh, uh, oxygen is required for one procedure or the other, especially downstream uh, when uh, different products are being created from the raw material. And once you have oxygen in a uh, let's say a pipeline or uh, another reactor, there is a good chance that you may end up uh, creating uh, some hazards. Uh, like if there is an energy source, you may cause a fire. So there is this very standard guide for evaluating non-metallic -metal materials for oxygen service. Uh, again, this is a guide, so it is not mandatory. It's meant to provide an overview, uh, the best practices that the industry must and follow. Now, uh, just after I've given you some good idea of what standards are, let me explain why uh, the whole uh, idea of, of, of standards makes sense. And um, I believe we are about 25 minutes into the uh, presentation. Uh, once I conclude this, we'll take a break for about one minute and move on. Um, so going back to the core principles of international standards, uh, the reason this whole uh, uh, push for standards has taken a lot of hold uh, is because of the uh, World Trade Organization agreements, uh, which had to do with technical barriers to trade. Uh, and the principle uh, for the technical barriers to trade is uh, the, the principal aim of that is to allow technical regulation standards and conformity assessments uh, procedures to be non-discriminatory and not create unnecessary obstacles for trade. So in other simpler words, standards help us to trade easily, better, and make more economic prosperity. Now, ASTM and all other organizations adhere to these core principles. Uh, the, they, they want want to make sure um, that they're being open and transparent about uh, conducting the development of these standards. Uh, they're seeking consensus and impartiality. Uh, they're developing relevant standards and uh, ensuring coherence. Uh, this means that the technical experts must be mindful of any existing standards and um, resist standards developing uh, projects that might be duplicative or overlapping. So there is this, uh, there is this agreement between different organizations and they, they kind of tend to work together. Now the TBD principles uh, are a provision and, and it, just like all other standards organization, uh, ASCM also adheres to it. Another important thing that I want to point out is the development dimension. So the ASCM standards, as for the TBT conventions, realizes that some of the developing countries may not have the kind of say that they need um, to have uh, when standards are being developed. So by principle, uh, they make an effort to include um, 
those stakeholders in the development process. And at times, they also provide aid to developing countries to make sure that they are also part of the process. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's a language. It's a process which allows different stakeholders to come together, talk the same language, um, and improve safety and reliability of products. Uh, just to sum it up, why you want to use a standard as a customer, as a manufacturer, as a purchaser uh, or seller of goods, because it helps you uh, when you're writing contracts. Uh, individual companies and agencies worldwide, they use the standards for various purposes. Um, like I said, purchases, uh, purchasing and, and selling of goods. Uh, it helps writing contracts. Uh, people like architects, like I gave the example of, of, of architect building a building or a designer. Let's say you're designing a new cell phone cover and you want to make sure that it conforms to the iPhone or the Samsung. All of those um, standards would become uh, handy for you. Uh, or engineers like myself or researchers like myself who are working in a lab and they want to test a, a, the, a simple property of a material like its density or its strength. We can then go on and use a standard and uh, follow the uh, letter of the standard to get the properties we need. And it would not matter if I have done that uh, test in my lab here in Qatar uh, or someone else has done that in a different part of the world, the properties would then be consistent. Uh, when it comes to businesses, they want to ensure that the components they are making, uh, they are compatible with other systems. Uh, think of you creating a small part, which is going to fix, fit in an automotive or a airplane, uh, unless you conform to a specific standard, uh, which is met by that bigger component, you will not be compatible with that system. So standards help build us, uh, help build uh, ecosystems at a much larger scale. Uh, if uh, a business is selling a system, they want to make sure that the components they are purchasing uh, to build their system will work. And uh, this ensures, again, interconnectivity and interoperability. Uh, of course, uh, once you're using the standards, uh, the compatibility uh, can be short. And I think the, the, the easiest example for me would be uh, beyond uh, scientists and engineers working in a lab or government agencies uh, uh, trying to build regulation codes and laws. Codes are just about, uh, standards are just about making good decisions. Let's say that you want to make sure that the USB you're going to buy is going to fit into your device. A standard would help you achieve that. A lot of us have now switched to 5G uh, and there is a reason uh, because there is a new standard out there that you can look up and you can see the benefits of why I do want to make that decision. So there is this, this consumer side of things as well. Decision making uh, also becomes easier. Simply put, uh, there are basically two reasons uh, for uh, developing specification type standards. Uh, one, you want to operate safely and you want to make sure that things operate uh, with each other. Uh, again, I gave you an example of an iPhone. If you create a cover, if they don't fit, it won't work. The second real reason is we want to ensure reliability and make sure that the environment, uh, environmental issues are taken care of. Uh, and another thing I think entrepreneurs would uh, appreciate more is that standards provide a strong foundation work. If you want to start to build a new technology, it is very good for you to first go and look at some standards. Uh, are you on the right track with your new technology? Are you going to conform to some of the existing technologies? Are you impeding someone else's work? All of these can then be sorted out by looking at standards. And of course, if you want to enhance an existing uh, practice, uh, standards provide a very strong foundation. And repeating the same thing again, uh, standards also provide a lot of choice for the consumer. I'm just peeking at my watch to see how much time do I have. I think this is a good time to take a quick step, quick break for one minute. Uh, I'll post this slide here. Uh, this one is basically going to tell you how to read a standard. Uh, and in order to keep track, a numbering system is used. I'll explain that in a little bit. So let's just take one minute break. If you have any questions, please go ahead and post them. I can see a few of these 
but I'll try to answer them in about one minute. So let me pause for one quick minute here. All right, let's get started again. Uh, if you look at this standard that I've just uh, posted on my uh, screen, uh, it has these designations here. There is a, there is a letter here, G, uh, and then there are these three letters which basically tell us the reference number given to this standard. Uh, this number here, it tells us the year uh, the standard was created in, G, the letter that I explained to you, it basically tells you what kind of materials you're dealing with. In this case, you're dealing with anything that has to do with corrosion, deterioration, or degradation of uh, materials. Now, uh, the, the title of the standard would always include what type of standard it is. Like this one is a standard test method. And it would also tell you who issued the standard in the first place, it's ASTM, what is the number, how many um, designations uh, it includes, and uh, some other boilerplate items. Now, standards, before we get into reading a specific standard, have a very specific language, and I want to make sure that we're on the same page with that. Uh, shell, when it's used in a standard, it's a provision uh, which is mandatory. It, it, it underscores that the that requirement you're dealing with is mandatory. If you see the word should, it usually means that provision is not mandatory and it's more of a uh, recommendation. It indicates recommendation. Uh, if there is me, it uh, indicates it's a permissible action. It's okay to do it. Uh, and there are no reservations against it. So there is this difference between shall and should uh, and may. Will, on the other hand, expresses futurity, basically what you would want uh, to happen, but never uh, to indicate any degree of requirements. And there are two other words which tend to be quite challenging to, uh, to not confuse, um, and these are that and which, uh, especially in the world of engineering standards. These two worlds are not interchangeable. Uh, that is reserved for essential uh, or what we call restrictive clauses, uh, which is appropriate and non-essential or non-restrictive or uh, non-restrictive class, uh, or another way of saying that it is that if a comma was there. So again, these are some common language items in standards, shall, should, may, will, and then there are these two which tend to be a little confusing. Moving on, um, I want to show you how a typical standard would look like. So instead of going for an ASTM, I pulled a technical standard from IEEE website. Uh, and, and any standard that you find, you would see uh, these, these five major categories or five major, major sections in it. There'll be a cover page. Uh, ASTM standards don't have a cover page, but they have their description of the cover. Uh, the cover page will include uh, top to bottom. It'll put you the standard number. It'll have the full title of the standard. It'll tell you what is the sponsoring society. In this case, it's the IEEE Computer Society. It will also tell you the organization, um, the standards committee, which was uh, working on it. So in this case, it was sponsored by the standards committee LAN, LAN, and the other networking society uh, committee. Then there is a boilerplate section. Boilerplate basically means there. This is the section where you would see a lot of general information, 
about the development and use of a standard. Uh, this information includes things like definitions of the sponsor, who is the sponsor, uh, if there's a list of disclaimers, um, legal liabilities, patent disclosures, uh, if there's a conflict uh, that needs to be identified with respect to the language, uh, and if the standard is published or not. Um, another example would be that once you look at the standard, the 802 r it deals with um, these boilerplate items. Uh, and and, and the, the, I guess what I'll do is next, I'll show you a typical ASTM standard. Um, but the bottom line is the following. These are the five sections that you would always see in a technical standard. They may be named a little bit differently, but boilerplate items, which have general items, scope and purpose, which really identify why is this standard written, normative references that are must, and then the definitions that go uh, into that standard. Moving on, uh, so sections of a typical ASTM standard, uh, these 15 or so sections would always be present. And uh, some of these will have um, stronger implications than others. I'm just gonna take a moment to show you a typical ASTM standard while we look at these so that we're on the same page. And by way of that, I'll just switch here. Coming back to my main screen, I think there are a couple of answers as well. Just give me one moment, please, guys. All right, so let me just resume the screen share again. Typical standards, the important ones are what I've listed here, scope. It includes information relating to the purpose of the standard and if the standard has any known limitations. This is usually the first section of most standards. So let me see if I can pull one of my standards and I can show you how the scope looks like. Like I said, uh, just going back, this is the designation. It's a G, uh, corrosion related standard. 86 is the reference, 98 is the year it was first uh, created and then it was reapproved in 2011. Here is the title. It identifies that it's a standard test method, not a guide, not a guideline or uh, specs type um, standard. Going on to scope. The first thing the scope will tell you is that what is the purpose of this um, standard? This one in particular decides uh, that if you want to use test equipment and techniques, what are them if they want, if you want to choose determine the impact sensitivity of materials in oxygen under two different conditions. Another thing the scope will list is what are not covered in this standard. So if you look here, the 1.4 uh, bullet item here would tell you that the standard does not purport to address all of the safety concerns, if any, associated with its use. Uh, it is the responsibility of the user of the standard to establish appropriate safety and health practices and determine the application of regulatory limitations prior to use. So the scope defines the purpose and it also identifies some of the limitations. Now I saw one question that had to do with the, um, with the, uh, with the standards for the telecom industry. Unfortunately, I don't have anything on me. 802 is the only one that I could talk about. Maybe we'll do that at the end. Now, moving on, some of the other important section of the standard are referenced documents. So here you would see the reference documents. It's nothing but listing of all documents, ASTM or others that have been relied upon when you were creating this particular standard. So if you notice here, there are ASTM standards listed here and there are military documents uh, listed here from the US, the American Chemical Society standard uh, definition of a particular region just given. Uh, then there are some compressed gas association uh, standards also listed, which are used or referenced in this particular uh, standard. Moving on, uh, the, next stand, uh, the next thing you will see in your standard would be terminology. Basically it will contain significant words that may have a more specialized or uh, restricted um, meaning within the standard. So it's a term of arts, it will describe them. Uh, different than 
some of the common definitions that you may see. So for example, this particular standard is for gaseous oxygens and liquid oxygens, and you will see the words gox and lox here. So these are some specific uh, definitions and acronyms that you will see. Another thing would be mechanical impact. People like me understand it quite uh, easily because this is our field. But if you are not belonging to this field, then you can use this terminology section and clearly understand what is the purpose uh, and meaning of the term mechanical impact. It just means you're blowing something onto uh, a specific item. So terminology is important. It provides uh, a non-essential reader, uh, for example, the ability to uh, cipher some of the examples. And it also lists things like discussion items, uh, some thresholds, etc. Moving on, uh, the next thing you would see in a specific standard would be significance and use. Let me just see if I can find it. This section here, significance and use, it basically explains the relevance and the meaning of the standard within the market and how it is typically used. Uh, so for example, here in 5.1, you would see this test method evaluates the relative sensitivity of materials in ambient pressure liquid oxygen and then other types of oxygen. So it specifies what standard segment of the market you're looking at. Uh, it would also allow you to look at what specific cases this standard would not be applicable to, uh, or comparisons to some other procedures. So for example, here, if you read 5.3, it says suggested criteria for discontinuing the test. So basically it tells you what things are not included in this standard. Now, because this is a test method, it will also have an apparatus section. Let me see if I can squeeze that out. Sample prep, I believe. I keep going down, I should be able to find the region's material safety. Give me one moment, guys. Test apparatus. So that's an other important section. Uh, basically tells you what are the essential features of the apparatus that you need if you want to conduct this test. So again, there's nothing hidden about it. It's consensus beyond borders. The test method is provided. Details are provided you're provided with details of the apparatus that you need to test it. And in some cases, ASTM also records very nice high quality videos that would be provided to you if you were part of an organization and you wanted to do that test for yourself. So the test apparatus uh, essentially describes everything that you need to know about a specific equipment uh, and the apparatus if you uh, want to uh, recreate some of the data that has come out of this standard. Uh, regions basically means chemicals. I'm just going to go back to the uh, procedures and just give me one moment. Regions and materials. It basically tells you what are specific items we're looking at. Um, who is uh, the primary uh, market, uh, or, or sorry, the producer of a specific uh, chemical that you're using? Uh, it also includes requirements for each material, such as levels of concentration, desired properties, etc. Uh, procedure, I think I already sort of explained. It tells you a proper sequence of detailed directions. I'm just going to switch back to my slides here. I think we're coming close to where we were. So we were at procedure. It tells you proper sequence of detailed directions for performing the, the standard tests that is described in your uh, standard. It would also most importantly tell you how you will calculate your results. This is very important again. Remember what I was telling you, I wanna measure the specific property of a steel bar. Let's say Cutter Steel produced it. And I wanna test it by using one of the ASTM standards. They will tell me what apparatus I need, but they would also tell me how you wanna use the data that comes out of uh, the test that you have performed. So you can actually calculate the results and there's a standard method uh, for it. Uh, another thing would be a report. I'm sorry, I just skipped a slide. Report basically states the detailed information required uh, for reporting uh, this according to the standard. There'll be other specific engineering terms like precision and bias. So it'll tell you how good the results are, um, what you need to do to analyze them, uh, the usefulness and the purposeness 
uh, of a specific application, the precision that was used, uh, or is mandatory if you want to draw some conclusions out of the standard. Keywords is a, is a good way to search these items. I already showed you the website, so let me switch back to the website for one quick moment here. And let's see if I can show you how you would go about searching specific items. So if I'm here, I'm on the STM compass, and if I want to search a specific standard, let's say I want to go for steel, as soon as I hit steel, it will start to show me pretty much everything that exists on steel. Um, and the good thing about these keywords is that the, the standards are listed just like any research document or a technical document by these standard keywords. And the ASTM compass is a good tool because it allows us to sort of look at specific categories as well. So I want to go for a process instead of a material. I'll just go for the process for the material here and it'll help me look at that specific segment of uh, standards. Um, I guess I'm close to concluding what I wanted to show. So I'll just get back to the website one more time. And here you have the standards for specific uh, materials. If you want to go back and look at steel, steel you can do that as well. Uh, again, I just want to make a comment. This is just an introduction to standards. Uh, and the, the initial intention is, uh, on my behalf, that I can give you the tools that are necessary so you can take them and you can go and explore other standards. It may not be your fields, what I'm showing you. So the best way to take the most out of the workshop would be that you use the information that I've just given you. You can go explore the IEEE website. You can look at the ISO standards. You can look at the uh, ASTM website. Whatever your field is, you then need to do some research um, and find out what are some of the specific standards that are relevant to your work. If you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to start a new business, it's super important for you to go and do that bit of research to see what exists, what are some of the standards. It goes without saying that if you do not do a good thorough research on the standards that exist and you create a new product, you will have challenges uh, integrating it into the existing systems or existing app systems. If you do follow standards, another thing that they do for you is they allow you to be legally covered. So minimum requirements are satisfied as soon as you describe that I have used this standard and there's a good chance uh, you will not uh, be uh, bothered by uh, legal disputes. So that's another added advantage of uh, sticking to standards, especially when you're a uh, entrepreneur. Going back, uh, to the final item. Uh, with that, I will conclude. Um, I believe I have one more term that I will describe. Uh, the importance of appendices and references here. I think references I already covered. Appendices are really just, they contain some non-mandatory information. That is information uh, that's not necessary uh, for a specific application. Um, these are often uh, provided as annexes as well. Uh, and footnotes here, they intend, they're really intended only for references and are never included as instructions necessary for application. Um, I believe this covers the typical sections that you would see in a ASTM standard. So moving on, let me go back to my set of slides. I'll do a quick knowledge check before I conclude the session, and then we'll break into a Q&A if there are any specific questions. So the knowledge check is quite straightforward. Reference documents contain new materials to be incorporated in an existing ASTM standard and may contain corrections to that standard. What do you guys think? Is it a true or a false? I'll wait a few couple more minutes before we conclude. Okay, I see a little bit of a confusion. Uh, not necessarily uh, incorporated uh, in an existing standard. Reference documents do not typically contain new materials uh, or corrections. They are typically only going to tell you what was used to create the standard. 
but we can discuss more um, as I close the session. So some of the conclusions are the following. I think hopefully by being part of the workshop, you should be able to tell uh, what a standard is. These are documented guidelines that are used by industry. Uh, they are developed by stakeholders, including consumers, experts from academia, government agencies, and then the framework is provided by organizations like PSTM. Uh, appreciation of standards is important to ensure safety, reliability, and um, environmental care, although I didn't give you a specific example, maybe I can answer that as part of the question. Uh, if you understand the components that make up a standard, uh, its title, sections, they are pretty uh, straightforward and they are very similar what are used by uh, pretty much most standard uh, development organizations. I think the best thing that you want to take away from this would be that standards provide us uh, sort of the minimum requirements of a specific uh, test method, uh, guidelines, uh, specifications, and they provide us a solid foundation upon which we can build new technologies or we can enhance existing ones. So with that, I think I'm on uh, point. I did have the idea that I would run out of time. So I just put a couple of uh, bullet points here. If you are, are interested in developing a new ASTM standard, what you need to do. Basically, uh, there are subcommittees that uh, work and create standards. If one of the existing subcommittees identifies that there's a need for a new standard, or uh, a stakeholder from industry uh, can approach the ASTM committee, then a new standard can be thought of. Uh, I think I'll just leave with this little um, cartoon, which tells you there's a need. You can either go through a subcommittee or an outside rep to ASTM. And if these bullet items are met, is there interest? Uh, is there a parallel that exists or not? Uh, where would this activity fit within a specific ASTM committee? Uh, and do we have the right stakeholders available as part of the application process? then um, a new standard can be built. Uh, but I guess what I will do is I'll take some questions at this point and I will conclude the workshop. I hope that you are able to get something out of it. Thank you. This is my email address. If you have more questions, specifics, ASTM standards or other standards, I'd be happy to address them if we don't get to them in the Q&A. All right. All right, so, so there is a very good question by uh, one of the audience members. Uh, I'd take the liberty of uh, calling her out. Her name is Yara. She's asking, are ASTM standards solely for creation of physical products? Are there standards available for digital products or companies that offer services rather than products? Uh, that's a great question. I believe that um, digital uh, items are not primarily covered in ASTM, but I'd be uh, lying if I told you that I am a verified. I believe uh, most of the ASTM standards would deal with uh, testing of materials and uh, processes. There are some standards which are related to digital products, but they mostly have to do with um, manufacturing related technologies. So if there is a cybersecurity issue for a specific manufacturing process, they'll definitely do something about that. There'll be a standard for it. Um, but I could find out and, and I can tell you more about it. Great question. Any other question, guys? So yes, I, I think there's another question about the telecom standards. Uh, uh, again, it's not directly my area of expertise, but what I could do is I could just quickly switch and go to the IEEE website and I could show you what kind of standards there are. You can look at information technology, power and energy, smart grid systems, telecommunication, all of these different deals are uh, mostly dealt by the IEEE standards. 
again, there's no real difference in the way the consensus is achieved. The philosophy of all international technical standards is the same. You want to bring in the uh, core stakeholders and um, come up with the minimum set of uh, agreement uh, on specifications. So with that, I conclude. I believe we are on time. We have a couple more minutes. So I'll stick around if there are other questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. I think there is another question about the 802 standard uh, by Fatima. I think I could pull it, but uh, it will have to be a specific standard uh, rather than just 802 itself. So Fatima, unfortunately, I don't have my VPN connected, so I'm unable to pull the IEEE 802, um, but I think what I could tell you is that you could go on to the Explore and you can look for the IEEE uh, 802. This one is obviously a course on that, but you can also visit the IEEE website to look for the specific standards. And within that, it's very similar to how the um, COMPS works in ASTM. And A2 should be visible, but I could definitely look it up and I could share it offline. Thank you. All right, I believe that we're on time. I don't see any other questions. So with that, we'll conclude. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, there is going to be another workshop tomorrow where I'll basically talk about sustainability related issues and how you may be able to do um, echo audits. Uh, so uh, I do strongly encourage if you're interested, please come. That'll be a more hands-on uh, workshop where you'll be able to do some actual uh, analysis. Thank you.